and we're using, this table is going to be uh, where we tell the story. So this will be the storyteller's chair here. Okay, uh, my name is Joe Van Boyd, to those of you who don't know, and uh, I am a I have some Cherokee ancestry blood. Uh, uh, my my maternal one of my maternal grandfathers. I don't know exactly which one. I learned about this late in life after I moved back here. I, I grew up not knowing I had Cherokee ancestry. But when I moved back here in 97, two of my dads, uh, my dad had died when I was three and a half, my mother died when I was two. I didn't know much. Uh, I knew all, I knew a lot about my mother's folks. I knew almost nothing about my dad's folks. And it was my uh, through my dad that one of his Either his grandfather, maybe my great grandfather, I'm not sure which one. But two of his sisters were still living. And uh, Aunt Mary uh, Poe, some of y'all might have known her, and Aunt Stella Weems was still living. And uh, both of them told me about, about it. And, and when Ronnie came up with the idea for this organization, I fortunately knew that I had some. Uh, However, when I was 15 years old, I was adopted into the Kiowa tribe. I was 15, I was going to school in Winsboro High School, and I got this letter in the mail from a guy named Dewey Goomba in Mountain View, Oklahoma. Totally unexpected. He had seen my name in the youth section of the Farm and Ranch magazine which used to be, the mo uh, in, my, in my childhood, in my boyhood, it was the most popular magazine in this area. I, I mean, I don't mean just the most popular farm magazine. It was the most popular magazine of any kind in this area. And it didn't matter whether you were a farmer or lived in town. But, you know, it was just the, the magazine everybody took. And uh, it had a youth section in it called the Cousins League. And I joined that early on at uh, a, a very, fairly young age. I had a story published in the, in the Farm and Ranch uh, Cousin Lee section when I was 14. And I remember it had a, that you, they had a scale of uh, membership in the Cousins League and the Farm and Ranch magazine. And uh, I, was, I think I was, I was an honor club member, second class when I had the story published. The name of the story, it was a fiction story, and uh, it was called Wild Stallion. Uh, and it was uh, uh, in two parts. But anyway, in it, in the, they, they put your name, once you were a member of the Cousins League in Farm and Ranch, they put your name and address. Nobody had phones in those days, uh, and nobody in the country anyway. And, but your, and you would get pen pals, people were, and you would put your interests, the things that you were interested in. And so I, would, I, had, I was writing to people all over the Southwest about that time. I was getting letters, and I, and I was answering them, sending letters to other people and all that. Uh, and this, this Indian, Kiowa Indian named Dewey Goomba, who was, at the time, I was 15, he was 35 at that time. He had children older than me, uh, and he had one, one, one of his children was almost exactly my age. But he wrote to me because he said, I've always wanted to have a friend in Texas. That was his, mm -hmm. his only reason, he said, for writing to me. And we struck, and, and I think the reason the correspondence didn't die out pretty soon was because he was interested in country music, and he sang country music. He wrote songs, country music songs, and that was probably my primary interest at the time. And uh, so he and I, as we got, as I got older, uh, and we got both of us, eventually I got a little tape recording machine, and so did my friend Dewey Goomba in Oklahoma. We started ex exchanging tapes instead of letters, or in addition to letters in some cases. And when I was living in, uh, and I finally met him in person when I was uh, at an at a army camp. You know, I, I was in the army, and 
then I had to stay in the reserves for six years. I went to to camp every to, for two weeks, every one of those six years. And usually I went to Fort Sill. Sometimes they would send me to Fort Bliss because I was into artillery, and those were the two artillery uh, schools. And so one of the times, I, first time I was at Fort Sill for camp, I got I decided to drive up and see uh, Dewey Gumba. And I spent uh, a weekend with him and the family. And, uh, and got to know the whole family and became uh, close, close friends. We continued the, and we, we, we remained friends. He came to see me after I moved uh, back to Texas in 73. And uh, we had a lot of, uh, and I, I went to see him on other times, went up to the Anadarko, to the uh, uh, American Indian Exposition, which his, bro and his brother at the time, Robert Goodbye, was chief of the Coyotes. So then when I was in, in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania, going part-time there when I was working for Foreign Journal, uh, I, was I was getting a degree in folklore. And one of the classes I had to take was the folk tale. And I, I arranged for Dewey to send me tapes of uh, Kiowa folk tales. And then I transcribed them you know, I wrote him out, and and he and I and then I interviewed him and asked him to tell me what he could about the stories, and that was part of my paper that I did for credit uh, in the folk tale. Uh, that was all I did, but that was one of the main things that I did. And so what? And most of the stories that he told on the tapes was about a, a guy named Sandy. That's the way he pronounced it. He didn't write it out, so I didn't. It sounded like he was saying Sandy, like S-A-N-D-Y, and that's the way I transcribed it, S-A-N-D-Y. <clears throat> and it turned out that Sandy was a trickster type and a kind of a not exactly a divine figure, but but a, a superhuman type a figure in the Kiowa tradition, and. <clears throat> And I have this book now that I picked up recently that has a Sandy story. It's actually spelled S-E-N-D-E-H in this, in this book. And this one is, the title of this one is uh, Cindy Sings to the Prairie Dogs. And that's the one that I'm going to read. I give you all that background, whether you wanted it or not, because I thought it kind of added a little something to uh, the fact that I have this long time connection. Oh, and Dewey and I kept corresponding and visiting with each other until he died. Uh, he died uh, like the, the, about the time I moved down here, back here to Winsboro in 97. Uh, and uh, he was in his 80s when he died. And the last time I saw him alive, he was in the hospital at uh, Lawton. And you know, he, he had had a couple of strokes over the years. And, uh, and the time this second stroke had robbed him of his ability to speak, he couldn't talk. You know, so we just kind of had to do sign language and write little notes out to each other and that sort of thing. And I took my baritone ukulele up there and inserted it. And it was we had we, had, we used to send each other songs and uh, on, on the on the tapes. And when we were together, we would sing together and that sort of thing. And I got to serenade him the last time that we were together in person. But here is the, the story about Cindy sings to the prairie dogs. Cindy the trickster was always going somewhere. Always up to something. Ah, I'm hungry. He thought one day as he was jogging along and saw a prairie dog village just ahead. I do like roast prairie dog, he said to himself, but how am I to get enough of them to make a good meal? Shoot one or club one, and all of the others run down their burrows. Now, Cindy loved schemes, and because he was clever and cunning, he knew right away what to do. The prairie dogs sat up straight with the holes that were the doors to their burrows and watched him come. They were ready to vanish at his first sudden move. Ah, my friend, Cindy called out, how handsome and happy you look this morning. It is a long while since I've been 
such a bright-eyed and beautiful company of dancers. Well, the prairie dogs all picked their ears up, for they loved more than anything else to dance. One heat came from a distant drum and one note from a faraway flute, and the prairie dogs would jump up and dance the day and half the night away. We were not dancing, said we. We have no drummer. No drummer, exclaimed Sammy. Why then, I shall be your drummer. Come over here where the ground is clear for dancing, and I will beat time on the ground with my stick. Make room, he said, as the prairie dogs crowded around. Make room for me to beat time. Now dance and close your eyes to hear the beat better while I sing. Some of the little prairie dogs closed their eyes and they all began to dance. Sandy began to sing. Prairie dog, prairie dog, prairie, tail, shake tail as I sing, as I sing, I beat the ground. Wonderful, Sandy called out after they had danced for a while, but I grow warm. Let us all sit down and rest a while. Prairie dogs chattered away as they rested and told Sandy he was a fine drummer and a fine fellow. When he said, come, let us dance again, they leaped up all at once and began, they closed their eyes, danced in a happy dream. Prairie dog, prairie dog, Sandy sang again. As he sang, he beat time with his stick on the dancers. He hit every one of them, but one little prairie dog at the far side of the circle who had kept her eyes half open. The little one squeaked and ran for her burrow, with Sandy close behind him hitting with his stick, but missing every time. Ha ha, he said, as she disappeared down her hole. Go then, someone must, must be the mother of the prairie dogs to come, so now it will be you. Feeling pleased with himself, he carried the other prairie dogs down to the river bank, where he heaped them up, piled on wood, made a fire. Then he looked around for something to do, and he waited for his dinner to roast. Not far away, he saw a tree with branches well set for climbing and a forked branch that gave him a good idea. I will practice my magic on that tree. I will sit up in that fork and tell the branches to twist around me, he said. Sandy was just not an ordinary fellow who played tricks. He had learned some magic powers and wished for more. What could be more fun than making rocks or water or trees do what he wanted? So he climbed the tree, perched there, the branches forked. Branches, he commanded, twist around me so that I cannot get free. And they did. Sandy did not know that Coyote was nearby. Coyote had sniffed the roasting meat and hurried to investigate. He hid behind a clump of willows and listened. When he saw what Sandy was doing, he crept through the trees. A few moments later, Coyote came into sight of the path down to the river. He stumbled along, held his stomach, groaned. His face lit up when he saw Sandy. Hey, Sandy, it's you. I'm starving. I smell meat in your cook fire. Will you be a friend? And when you've eaten all the best parts, leave the bones for me. Indeed I will not, Sandy told him. I killed my meat for myself. People should feed themselves. Go away. Hunt your own gray dogs. But I am too weak, Coyote whispered. I cannot lift a club. I cannot pull a bowstring. Pop! Cindy shouted down at him. I will keep my food for myself. I not eat the bones and all. Cindy was about to say, Tree, go back to your own shape. But Coyote was quicker. Tree, stay that way, he called out. Cindy is a bad one. He's too selfish to spare even a bone. Keep him up there. Sandy stroked the tree and spoke softly. Tree, go back to your own shape. But it did not. Tree, Sandy said more sharply. Go back to your own shape. It would not. Tree, go back to your own shape, Sandy commanded loudly. The tree still stayed as it was, and Coyote saw that he was safe. He went to the fire, raked off the coals, and began to eat the roast prairie dogs. Tree, go back to your own shape, Sandy roared. When the tree would not, he began to wheedle. Come, friend Coyote, 
let me come down and I will give you half. Calvary did not answer. His mouth was too full. As he ate more and more, Cindy called out, You're eating it all. You must leave some for me. If you do not leave some for me, when I get free, I will hunt you down. He was so angry that he drew his knife, stabbed at the tree, but still it would not let him go. Coyote finished at last, wiped his mouth, moved a little way, called back, tree, go back to your own shape, and then he ran. The tree's branches sprang back to their own shape. Sandy climbed down and ran to the fire, but he found nothing but clean bones. If it takes until winter, I will find that coyote he cried. And he set out to find him. Every coyote he met, he caught. Hey, nephew, are you the fellow who ate my fairy dogs? It was not I. Every coyote yelped, do not hit me. Then open your mouth, Sandy commanded. But when he looked inside their mouths, he never saw or smell any meat sticking in the teeth of any coyote heart. He may be looking still. <laughs> the end. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's get it. Well, mine is not exactly a story. That was good, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, it was. I wish I, wish I had a good story. But mine is just sort of an informative, I guess. I was looking at this, actually it's a coloring book, but it tells a little bit about each Indian tribe. And so I was reading on this one, and I thought, I've never heard of this one. It's Nez, P-E-R-C-E. -E. Nez Perce. i never heard of it. That's so Chief no. Joseph's tribe. Huh? What did you say, Nez Perce? Yeah. You've heard of Chief Joseph? Yeah, but I didn't realize. He, he was the nice first. Well, what were they famous for? I will fight, fight no more from this day forward. <laughs> the, the United States Army in the late 1800s, it took them about three years, and they ended up going into Canada. Mm -hmm. And that was when he made the saying, I will fight. Never again. No more. No more. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. I, 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 he, I, he was famous for keeping his, keeping the Nez Perce out of battle and evading the United States Army all that time. That's what he was famous for. Yeah. Um, anyway, like I said, I, you know, I've never, never heard of this one that, of course, I don't read as much as you guys, and I sure had not been to some of the places that y'all have been to. But anyway, let me just read a little bit of this. Uh, their home was a land of high mountain meadows and wild flowers, cool streams, sheltered valleys, and shaded evergreen forests. On this bountiful northwestern plateau, the Nez Perce Indians lived in peace and raised beautiful horses. They wanted to preserve the generous earth for their children as their people had for hundreds of years. But the white man's government told them to leave the green hillsides that had heard the songs of their mothers. And before their ordeal was over, some of these Indians had led the U.S. Cavalry on a 1,300-mile chase and had come within a day's ride of escaping into Canada. <coughs> Nairs, Nairs, Purse gained fame as breeders of magnificent Appaloosas. Uh, but for most of their long history, they had no horses. They lived where the states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho now meet, in the country of the Clearwater, Salmon, and Snake Rivers. Originally dwelling in fishing villages along rivers, they built large multi-family lodges of timbers topped with grass and cattail mats. Salmon was the mainstay of their diet. Nez Perce hunted elk, deer, bear, and mountain sheep, and gathered berries and apple roots from the meadows. Spanish invaders introduced horses into the New World in the 16th century, but it was a long time after that before Indians had them in large numbers. The Nez Perce acquired horses perhaps 
as early as the end of the 17th century. First, the new preachers were wonderful luxuries. Then the Indians found that their well-watered plateaus and secure valleys were almost perfect horse country. These Indians developed their horse herds with great care. They selectively bred their animals by yielding or trading away inferior specimens and importing superior breeding stock. This produced well-built, strong horses that were highly prized. The tribe especially favored the colorful spotted Appaloosas, an ancient breed which the Nair, it's hard for me to say, Nez Perce diligently perfected. They adapted to the new mobility of the horse. Bands of Nez Perce <laughs> crossed the Rocky Mountains and met, traded with and fought other Indians on the high northern plains. They hunted buffalo and uh, lived in skin-covered teepees. They adopted the eagle feather headdress, horse accessories, games, and customs <coughs> from their new acquaintances. Even the many Nez Perce who remained in their traditional homelands could not help but be affected. The white man brought more changes. The Lewis and Clark expedition was aided by the Nez Perce in the 1805-06. After that positive encounter, the Indians endeavored to be friendly to whites for decades. Their goodwill was not appreciated. Gold and land-hungry whites swarmed over their domain. In 1855 and 1863, treaties slashed away huge portions from the Indians' territories until the Nez Perce were left with only a reservation on the Clearwater River in Idaho. Hmm, imagine that. Many of these Indians did not sign away their lands. Among them was a man of great eloquence and dignity, Chief Joseph. With a large, peaceful band of Nez Perce, thousands of horses, and many cattle, Joseph remained in the beautiful Walla River Valley in Washington and Oregon. In 1877, he was given a month's notice to move to the reservation. He tried to comply with the abrupt, abrupt deadline, but brutal acts by men of both races forced Joseph and several hundred Indians, the majority of whom were women and children, to flee eastward. They were pursued and repeatedly attacked by, by outnumbering U.S. troops. The Indians fought off and eluded their hunters time and again. For several months, Joseph and other great warriors led the Indians along uh, so many kilometers of rugged mountains and tangled woods through Idaho, Wyoming, and into Montana, where they were finally trapped a scant 30 miles from the Canadian border. Joseph surrendered and lived out his life in exile. He was a man of great leadership and compassion for his people. <clears throat> Chief Joseph's surrender speech is one of the most famous in Indian literature. It concludes as follows. I want to have time to look for my children and see how many of them I can find. Maybe I shall find them among the dead. Hear me, my chiefs, I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. And back in the days of the mountain men, they traded about anything that the men's purse would trade for. For one of their horses, their horses were the most prized horses. Mm -hmm. There was. And that is one thing the Calvary wanted. They wanted their, their horses. So strong. They, had, they were so strong and had a stamina and they could go forever. And there's a lot of, a lot of the, uh, well, I call it mountain men, the early settlers, crackers, and all. And it was nothing if they had one for somebody to kill them just for the horse.
Georgia. Georgia and Church. George O. Glenn? Glenn. Okay. Yes. 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 I don't know. I guess I was not paying attention, but I just, when I saw that, Glenn, Linda Fox. Yeah. Her, one of her pictures was a cheek gilder. Yes. Okay, Ed, you got anything else for us? Well, I was hoping Ed, I'd give anything if Linda was here, because I know she can shed a lot of it. And I had a, it was a big newspaper article, and I know, I don't know if I still got it, I thought I did, and I hunted and couldn't find it. But back in the, I'm going to say late 80s, uh, they were, uh, Something came up in the United States government, and they wanted to know something about the Indian tribe. And there was something, I can't remember, that's why I was trying to find that article. There was something the government wanted to know about their history. So our illustrious United States government and their infinite wisdom put out $1.3 million to form this committee to investigate and see if they could find this history that they, for some reason, they would want. Well, the, at that time, the main chief in that area, his son was in, uh, was in politics. He wasn't in Partington, but he was involved in politics, and he found out. And he told him, he says, well, he says, I can get all the history. No, we got to do it. The government's got to do it our way. Well, on his own, he went to the elders, his dad, and all of them, and in six months, he compiled the history back it took the government a year and a half and almost two million dollars. And when they finally got done, this son put his paperwork next to theirs. It was almost word for word, except he made corrections in what the government had. The government had some mistakes that he corrected. It took him six months and didn't cost anything. And I would give anything if I could find that newspaper because there was, I always thought that was, uh, you know, the Native Americans, uh, I've got books where it tells how they, uh, different members of the tribe are taught from a you know, young age, the history, and they learn all their uh, past history and everything. And so they've got their historians and their storytellers and all. And, but the United States government says, no, that ain't good enough. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and there's, there were several uh, cases similar to that. But, uh, anyway, one thing, uh, I, I was well, probably 40 years old when we found out I had uh, we were living in Fort Worth, and my folks lived in Michigan. We went up there one day, or one time on vacation. One wall in their kitchen was white brick, and uh, had built-in oven and the wall fireplace. Everything was pretty nice. Well, here's. A Cherokee plaque hanging on the wall. And I got to looking at it. I said, hey, that's neat. And uh, I says, asked my dad, I said, when did you get that? And he said, well, we was over in, down in, uh, well, I knew they'd gone to Tennessee. He was born and raised in Tennessee. And I knew they'd gone to Tennessee, but they went on over into North Carolina and over into Cherokee. North Carolina, around, and he was kind of tracing his ancestors. Well, that's when I found out that his mother 
was uh, Porter Cherokee. Mm -hmm. His grandmother was half Cherokee. And I said, well, we never knew that. He says, all the time you were growing up, he says, when you was little, he said, you had cap guns and you guys played cowboy and Indians. <laughs> and he says, all the cowboy shows, he says, the Indians were the bad guys. And he says, now, he says, back in the 40s and 50s, he says, the blacks were lower class. And he says, if you had Indian blood and people knew it, you was way down below them. He said, you were at the bottom of the totem pole. So he said, nobody ever mentioned it. Course, by this time, he'd retired. So, anyway, then, uh, of course, uh, my uncle off, his brother, and my aunt Pat, and all that, they knew what they had. They knew they were part of India, but nobody had ever mentioned it. And so, anyway, that's when I started getting a little interested in my heritage. I never paid any attention to it. Anymore. But uh, anyway, uh, my uncle, and he told some stories on my dad, and uh, uh, my dad, he never would answer. I'd ask him, did you really do that? He'd just smile. <laughs> and one of them, uh, my uncle and my dad both went to work at Chevrolet there in Flint, Michigan. And one Friday evening, they got paid. They were walking home, and uh, of course they didn't spend money on anything because nobody had money. And uh, this was back in the late 1920s. And they was crossing the railroad track. They said this big old black dude come up. Says he had a big hunting knife, and he grabbed my uncle's arm and demanded their their. Uh, Bill folks with their paychecks. Well, they just pulled their bill folks out. My uncle wasn't going to, my dad says, give me a bill folks. Well, they did. Now, my uncle told stories about my dad when they was growing up. He'd go squirrel hunting with a handful of rocks and bring squirrel back. And then when he was a pitcher on a baseball team in his younger days. You know. He said that dude started walking down the railroad tracks. He made about 50 foot. He says my dad reached down and picked up a rock about the size of a baseball. Never said a word. He says he hauled back and hit through it and hit that guy in the back of the head. He says he went down. My dad walked over, picked up that knife, stuck the blade under the rail, broke the blade off, picked the handle off. Got their bill folds, hand my uncle his, and says, come on, we got to get home. And that's all he said. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. It, uh, it, it got interesting after I found out we had some, uh, and then, <clears throat> now my dad's sister that lived in Missouri, their children, they didn't know that they were had Indian blood up till then, and uh, come to find out, my aunt there in Missouri had a book that had been written, or it was kind of like a diary <coughs> that uh, a great aunt had written on their on their history and everything. As much as she can, as much as she knew, and we started tracing our history back. <coughs> we got back, and my great great grandmother lived in a house in Tennessee. Which, when she was born, it was North Carolina, because North Carolina came over, and then they made the state of Tennessee. And if you look at the state of Tennessee flag, it's got three stars, which aren't, there's one here, one here, and one down here. 
Tennessee had three counties. It was east, central, and west. And this particular house, and that's as far as we could get. We could not find her ancestors. But this particular house, by the time we got it figured out, had been in four counties and two states. <laughs> because as they started breaking these big counties up, they kept changing names. And uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting that this one house where my great great grandmother lived was uh, in two states and three counties, and the house never moved. <laughs> Anyway, that's about what I got for this evening. Eddie, you got anything? You don't have anything? Mickey? Ronnie? He's got several stories, and I wish I could remember all of one. Um, I can't about talk the way that I used to. The right. dogs and the We're patient. Tails. The dogs in the tail. That, well, that was too bad. <laughs> no, it wasn't. That's funny. That was a, you want to share anything, Ronnie? I would love to, but I think that I, I would get everything messed up. You sure? Yeah. Well, I know that there's a story about when I was in the Army, and I was there for about two weeks. all the different songs and so when the when the uh, bird fell out, fell out he started hollering for help and and this the uh, 
Mockingbird, I mean the Redbird said, I'm not going to help him because he's been mocking these songs all my life and he's never going to help him. And so then the little chickadee, he went off singing from birds, room to room saying, I'm not going to help him. He's, he's uh, not helping because he never sings for us. And uh, the robin, he just puffed his chest up and he said, I'm not going to sing for he, because of him. And, the, and so the, dark, the sun was setting down and everybody, the, 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 the mockingbird said, please, please, somebody help me. I, I can't, he, he got a hit, the, the rock couldn't get up. And so nobody wouldn't help him do anything. And so finally, just as the suns began to go down, God sent the dove for to help the mockingbird. And uh, to that that reason, the the dove reached down and he picked out a feather to give the gray, they didn't, didn't, the love didn't have any pretty colors. So he gave the feathers to build a wing. Uh, wing. And when he then, um, he got up, the flu flew off because of that. And I'll end it with this, said that, and so from this time on, all the birds sang all the songs, but the mockingbird will never sing the song of the dove that they, that they can see. Sing everything else. It doesn't mock the dove. It does okay. all the other birds will mock the dove. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I never heard that before. Yeah. My grandfather, he was a storyteller, so we all learned him back then. So we always learned that about the. Yeah, his granddad was a storyteller and a half. He would tell stories one after the other. You would tell them? And long time. I can do that too. Well, we have have us a new storyteller. Uh, Carlos Miller is going to honor us uh, with the story. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the story. If you went to Winsboro High School in the 1950s to the 1975s or so, you may have visited the Talking Tombstone. It's a true story. I remember going to it the first time when I was about six years old. Might have been five, and that's the earliest event that I ever remember as a young child. And uh, it's a true story. There is a tombstone off of Highway 11, very near the Wood Camp County line. My father and mother married, uh, I'll tell you a little history, maybe this will, uh, uh, you can identify with this. Uh, they married in 1930, uh, went to West Texas where my father uh, became superintendent of three or four schools and then in La Mesa, Texas. We moved back here in 1953. and. I was uh, 14 probably at that time, and the story about the talking tombstone picked up again. My father was quite a storyteller, and this tombstone, which may be 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 pounds, it's about eight feet tall, and a family by the name of Morton are buried there. So every Halloween, my father, he was an educator, teacher, coach, served two terms as superintendents, uh, interim superintendent, when the superintendents of Winsboro got fired. 
he would step in and take up that role because he had been that out in the West Texas where I grew up. But anyway, he brought out the story again, told the kids at Winsboro, would you like to go on Halloween night out to see the talking tombstone and listen to it talk? And of course he had created enough, he was prepared for it. He had his wagon uh, pulled by his tractor and loaded with hay on Halloween night. And uh, some of you, uh, if I can maybe bring the Indians into this, the Indians probably were the trailblazers for the cattle drives through Kansas, Oklahoma, and down through Kalibit Springs on Highway 11, where the water flows freely from springs there. And uh, Bill Jones and Charlie Chickaboo Bowling, who I graduated from Winsboro High School in 1955, uh, we visited the area and Chickaboo showed us where the cattle drives went. They watered at uh, Klebit Springs. The springs are no longer flowing. We walked out there and saw where they were at one time. But anyway, uh, Charles, Charlie knew where the road, the drive went with the cattle. <coughs> and from that point, they went to Scroggins. There was a natural spring well at Scroggin, Texas. It's no longer flowing. It was behind this old store that's there. For those of you who remember Winsboro area. Uh, my favorite place to be in high school was pitching uh, hardball in the baseball field there at the Scroggin store. In 1954, the uh, American Legion team that I was a part of, uh, we destroyed all the other high school teams around here and I happened to be the pitcher at that time but I had to throw that in it has nothing to do with the Indian lore <laughs> but just bragging a little bit well anyway the uh, Indians probably followed this trail even before the cattle drives came along and of course the cattle drive bosses were looking for watering holes Cleveland Springs were their first stop uh, Scroggins Spring was their second stop, and from that point on, they followed the railroad track about four or five miles down there. I walked it uh, and rode horses in there to the back side of the Benton place. Gaston and Billy Bob Benton uh, family live there. There's a spring there that's still flowing and fills up the ponds in that area. At that point, uh, they, uh, the cattle apparently uh, headed a little more east and headed what now is uh, about where the county line is on the uh, highway level. Anyway, along that trail is where this tombstone is. It's the Morton family. They, uh, they were buried, one, I believe the uh, last one was buried in 1854. And they claimed a baby was born there, but we never found the headstone for the baby. We did find the two headstones for mom and pop. And the story my father discovered that on any night of the full moon, Any night of the full moon, if you approach that tombstone from the north, from the south, I'm sorry, and the two heads, I want y'all to help me here. Head to head, come here. This is part of the story. Oh, okay. I'm right here. You had to uh, approach this grave. The story goes from the south. Any night of the full moon, after sunset, without saying a word, you walked up to the grave and you stepped over. Oh, 
to the store. And by that time, the youngsters went to our high school were wondering what on earth was going on. Well, he said, I told you it was a talking tombstone. You have to holler and say, what are you doing down there? What are you doing down there? The three of us, that's all we got. Get ready to say it. Look down there and say, speak to it. What, what are you doing down there? there? What are you doing down there? Down there? Three times. What are you doing down there? What are you doing? What are you doing, are you doing, doing down, down there? there? Listen, listen very carefully. What did he say? Nothing at all. <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> Story, folks. The tombstone is there. My father has taken the youngsters out there from Winsboro High School. The of you went there. Uh, it was an annual thing to do on Halloween. But uh, occasionally he would have somebody that wanted to go out there and uh, he would take them with his tractor. But he took a trailer load loaded with hay on the Benton Road and from that point they had to walk across where this tombstone is. You can see it from that, uh, I forget the number of the county road there. You can see it from that road over to the east. Yeah, this way. And uh, that's the story. The cattle drives used to go by there and I'm sure the uh, Indians probably followed where the water was just like they did with their cattle drives. And that has actually happened, except for the fact, well, they did say nothing at all, didn't they? <laughs> okay. Did, did uh, you say your last name was Matt? Miller. Miller. Okay. Tell them. Yeah. Okay. Elmer Miller yeah. was my father. Yeah. He, was, he did well, a little bit of everything uh, for Winsboro Schools. family was the Knights. Knight. And they went on the Kalipit Springs property line with yeah. the They own the property the next property. to, uh, the well, Fridays. well, close Fridays. to the Bittons. Yeah. But what we have just, we have just put a new fence around <coughs> part of there. And what we found was there was an old a road uh, in there. We didn't know that's what it was. We had to clean up some of the brush and there's a hidden road in there and it was went goes okay, right along that the night property was uh mm -hmm. oh that road came out over there on scrogged road 115 uh -huh. yeah and the night down there the reason i know that was my girlfriend in high school which one uh, was your friend? Berlin night. Oh yeah, wow. Berlin. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Well. Now I'm going to tell you another story. Now until then, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> what? Are you saying you don't want this recorded? Yeah. Well, <laughs> big. Yeah, forty-three ninety is the last one before you get the county fine. I'm sorry, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> okay. Yep. okay. Okay, that leaves the Owens for their story. Uh, there you go. Y'all got a story? Came by 
our property, and from that point it went down to the bottom and crossed the bottom there, came out on the other side, and that's where they uh, drove the cattle to uh, board the, the boats at Caddo Lake. The drive went from our place, I don't know where it went from there, but uh, that's where they load the cattle at Caddo Lake because at one time it was a navigable stream. Um, anyway, that's it. That tree is the craziest thing. If you come the other direction, you just can't hardly see it. And I even come from both directions. Sometimes I can't see it. And I start out, I'm going to count the mile, exactly one mile, and it's out there if you look. Yeah, if you I'm, drive I'm, by I'm, trying to find it, you miss it. Right out there in the open. That was put at about a tenth of a mile over the county line in the Franklin County. Um, okay, now where, where are you Okay, as you turn off 11, going towards Scroggins yeah, on 115, right. go exactly one mile from that intersection toward Scroggins, yeah. and there's an old metal uh, garage or something out of a galvanized barn or something sitting out there, and it's right behind it, just sitting out there in the field. And that thing is shaped, you know, really a lot like that Mark yeah, Tree. I, I saw that. I don't know where it's at. We live right Just before you turn uh, here off of 11, just before you turn on 115, we go that way quite a bit. But I, I know it, it, it sets off to the right. Yeah. And it does where you're supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm close to half a mile before you get the yeah. post office. Yeah. Before you get the railroad track. Yeah. But we did find that the other didn't know that it was figure out that that was a trail. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know the, along, the, along the, the Cleveland Creek, Cleveland Springs. Cleveland Springs. Springs right mm -hmm. at the fence. Uh, they said the railroad bed used to, or railroad tracks were a little bit south of where they are now. But they were, uh, <coughs> I think, like the other side of the post office. So they used to run So are we done with stories? I just happened to think of one, Joe Dan, that I am <clears throat> about the Indians. My, my family, uh, they lived in, in Tennessee. And uh, I never, you know, they never claimed to be Indian or anything. But my great, great grandfather and his brother were traveling, uh, I guess it was in North Carolina, somewhere uh, into Tennessee, and they got caught in the winter up in the mountains in North Carolina and lived with the Indians for, I guess, for the whole winter. The Indians took them in, and uh, their name was Jackson. And, and I did see some uh, a notation way back in the Cherokee thing that there was some Jacksons, uh, Ralph Jackson and Anyway, they said that the uh, chief, so one of the, my, my grand, great grandfather's or great great grandfather's brother to marry the in, one of the princesses, the Indian's princess. <laughs> of course, they say all that. So, so everybody, when was this? Everybody got that, a that's story. That's the story her dad told when, anyway. It was my grandfather. When was it? Hmm. Oh, it had to be. Early 1800s or so, I imagine. I don't know. So, did he do that? I never did find out. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't think he did. He said, well, they'd give him a bushel basket full of gold if he would marry it. But, <laughs> but I don't think he married it. But, but when I was looking There's no record of any bushel basket of gold. <laughs> no. 
But that was our story, our family story, and, the, and their name was Burns and Jackson. Well, do you remember that uh, Indian we had on the program a couple of years ago, I guess, from uh, Gilmer, mm -hmm. that, whose name was, uh, whose Indian name was um, Smiling Otter Who Tames the Wind, and he had a whole bunch of stuff uh, up there, you know, uh, to look at. You remember right. him? He, and he talked for about an hour, right. you know, and uh, he, he said that... Um, a lot of the Indian tribes, other Indian tribes, uh, considered it a prize to have a Cherokee wife. That a lot of them went out and sought, you know, went out to find a Cherokee wife. You know, for something or other about the Cherokee uh, women that uh, the other other tribes prized uh, above their own. <laughs> Okay, and that was the way he told it anyway. Well, that's Cherokee with the best looking. My, grand, <laughs> my grandfather told me when I was very young, he said, well, he could teach me to count in Indian. So he taught me how to, you know, these one to ten. Well, I never did know what, as I knew it was Indian. Well, I, we were over in um, uh, New Echota. And we were at this Indian, where they, that's where they started the Trail of Tears over there. And I was reading this book, and I was looking at the counting, and I could read one to ten, the numbers. And so they said, then that was Cherokee. By that so one that lady, was, you, you counted for it. Uh -huh. And she said, well, you, you count perfect Cherokee. Yeah, but she said it was the old language. Yeah, yeah, she said it was the old language, not but the. They don't. The it's a little bit different nowadays. But uh, and she, she told you know I, we were in that that at attending that wedding in Oklahoma of our friends. Y'all saw the movie on that one, but uh, there was the, and she, it could have been. This lady, um, she was the chief. What was her name? Um, Wilma Mankiller. Wilma, Wilma Mankiller. Man mm -hmm. And she was, she was the one I was talking to. Yeah. And she said that she had lived in North Carolina on the reservation for a while. And she said that was the proper, you know, numbers to count. But it was an old. Old language then. At that time, Wilma Mankiller was the principal chief of the. I was going to say, is this the same one that yeah, was the yeah, chief? Yeah, she's the principal chief. Yeah. And I didn't know that when I was just sitting there talking to her. And we said, Dunker, her. we didn't know she was the principal chief. Yeah. <laughs> had a very nice and, conversation and she was just with her. Yeah. Like anybody else, you know. And but she, she said sitting she, and talking. Uh -huh. She did live. Found out there. afterwards that <laughs> she, she's, she was she's the big the main, honcho. She's the, the main one. I, I guess everybody knows that Tahlequah, uh -huh. the capital, yeah. stands for when the people sent to Carolinas, Texas, Oklahoma, the people got together and they said they'd get together and then pick a spot for the chapter, for the, for the capital. capital. And uh, it was a big rain come up, and everybody you couldn't get there, but two people came. And if you see with the words, they named Tahlequah means two's enough, because they had two people to decide who would be the capital, and that's where Tahlequah came from. It means two. Just one two word. Is two is enough. Yeah. And you know, every every year Labor Day, that weekend, well, oh, really, yeah. uh, used to always go. Yeah, the, the Cherokee homecoming. Mm -hmm. And well, I don't know how many years we went. We used to go every year. And uh, I always took a lot of pictures and stuff. I've always had cameras, but back when. Uh, yeah, you had the old wind-up eight-millimeter movie camera. I had them. 
But when they come out with the big uh, video cameras that took the full size cartridge I had and a real good Panasonic <coughs> and we was up there and they was having a ceremony and of course they announced no pictures. Well, uh, you know, uh, this uh, some of the ceremonies are not to be recorded. So anyway, they said that I just said I sat right out in the aisle. It was kind of a stadium arena. Indeed. I set my camera down, and I noticed this one guy. He he kind of upset me a little bit. He was a big old Indian. He got right over in the front, and I kept you know. Finally, when the ceremony was over, he come up. He pointed down. He says, no pictures. I says, no, I know. But when I set the camera down, I turned it on. There was a, and there was a little red light flashed when the camera was running. <laughs> he saw that, right? I looked up. I said, oh, man. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, I was embarrassed. <laughs> he, he stood there that whole ceremony to block the camera. And I thought he would just standing in the way, you know? rude, huh? <laughs> and, and evidently when I set that camera down, I must have turned it on. <laughs> but <clears throat> the thing was, it was almost at the end of the cassette anyway, so all I got was about three minutes of him standing there, and that was the end of the cassette, but it just kept blinking. So, anyway, I, I was very embarrassed when I found out, you know, what the deal was. You know, they won't share huh? part of that thing. They won't use. Nobody knows about it. No, no. It's it it not with, to be recorded. Yeah, I, they've, I've been asked to go with them, but uh, yeah, there's some ceremonies that you this taboo to record. So. <laughs> that happened to be one of them. <laughs> we always enjoyed it. If we ever learn to walk again, we'll go back. Be going back to Tahlequah. Go. Well, I'll tell you what. You get around a little bit, and we'll go up to Muskogee and go back through the museum with the five civilized tribes, and on over to Tahlequah, and yeah. maybe Fort Gibson. And we used to do all that. We used to make that round almost every year. And go up to the Illinois River. Yeah. And that is the prettiest country right at the end of the year.